Thank you, Joe. It's good to be able to be here and worship with the church in Edmonton. And uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to be able to be here. I want to remind you, thank you, Val, for your song. It talks about the baby that was born. I want to remind you of a song that you're familiar with. Uh, listen to the words that uh, you have heard many times, probably already this season, we'll hear many more times um, before Christmas arrives. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will calm the storm with his hand? <clears throat> did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? Mary, did you know when you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God? Mary, did you know? Did you know the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again? The lame will leap, the dumb will speak. Praises of the Lamb. I want you to think with me this morning. Why did God decide to come and be born as a baby? I mean, he's God. He could have done it a myriad of ways. Why a baby? <coughs> well, you see, it was prophesied that he would come and be born as a baby. But, but what if way back before he started creating this world when he made a plan, he'd made a different plan, so the prophecy would be different. I mean, he could have, he could have been, uh, he could have wandered into town as a young man, um, apprentice <coughs> carpenter and could have hooked up with Joseph, who had a carpentry shop, and could have learned his trade as a carpenter. Or he could have uh, arrived as a young man, a farmhand, and worked on the farm, or maybe a shepherd, like David, and, and tended the sheep out on the hillside. Or maybe he could have been a bricklayer. I mean, he, God could have had him come in many, many different ways. Why did he decide he should come as a thief? Have you ever pondered that? Because I think hidden within that is something very significant. Now let me explain. So, going way back to the Garden of Eden, once sin had come into the world, something changed within Adam and Eve. We don't know the whole, all the details, but it seems that, that God would come and meet with them each evening. And after they had eaten the fruit, when he came to meet with them, as he always had, he couldn't find them. They were hiding. And, and Adam said, I, I hid because I was afraid that after they had eaten the fruit, something had died within them. Spiritually, they had died, even though God had said, the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And even though physically they were alive, but they had died spiritually because they no longer were drawn to spend time with God, but were afraid of God. And, and interesting, God hadn't changed. God was still coming to meet with them, but they had changed. They just didn't realize how significantly they had changed. And so now they hid and they were afraid. So I want you to watch what happens. We'll do a quick survey of Scripture to see what happens when God tries to come and meet with mankind. So when he comes to Adam and Eve, they're afraid and they hide. So turn with me to Exodus chapter 3. And let's take a look at several passages just to kind of get this crystallized in our minds. Exodus chapter 3. And you know the story of Moses well. Moses now has left Egypt, escaped for his life, and he's a shepherd tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro. And he came to Sinai, the mountain of God, and there the angel of the Lord appeared to him, but he didn't know it was the angel of the Lord. He just saw a bush on fire. 
And so he said, this is amazing. He said to himself, verse 3, why isn't that bush burning up? I must go and see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at the face of God. So here, just like Adam and Eve, when he realizes God is in that bush, he is afraid. Now, if you just go over to chapter 20, so you know the story. Moses, God calls Moses to lead his people out of Egypt, and so now he has led them out of Egypt, and they've come to Sinai. And God has given them the commandments. He's recited it all in, in, cha in ver chapter 20, verse 18. It says, When the people heard the thunder and loud blast of the ram's horn, and when he saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountain, they stood at a distance, trembling with fear. They said to Moses, you speak to us, and we will listen. Don't let God speak directly to us, or we will die. And Moses says, don't be afraid. For God has come in this way to test you, so that you, you fear, your fear of him will keep you from sinning. So here God comes to them at Sinai, and they're afraid. And Moses tells him, look, you don't need to be afraid of God. But there's something within them that just made them so afraid. So let's move to Judges. A little bit farther along. Judges chapter 6. And here we find the story of Gideon. And Gideon is threshing wheat. And this angel comes to him. Uh, let's see, Judges 6, 22. The angel comes to him and talks to him, and, and in verse 22, so what happened was he said, let me, let me prepare something for you. He didn't realize it was an angel this time. It was just a being there. So he prepares some food, and he places it on the rock, and this angel touches it with his staff, and instantly fire comes up from the rock, consumes it, and the angel disappears. Verse 22, when Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he cried out, O oh, sovereign Lord, I am doomed. I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. It's all right, the Lord replied. Do not be afraid. You will not die. There's something inherent within mankind. Once we have sinned, that is afraid of God and think that, that we will die if we see God. And so each time the angel comes, he has to tell him, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And remind us that we don't have to be afraid. But just a little bit farther, uh, Judges 13. <coughs> Story of Samson. The angel comes and brings a message to Manoah's wife. Manoah's wife apparently didn't have a name. She was just known as the wife of Manoah. And so she, the, the angel revealed the message to her and she tells her husband and Manoah doesn't believe it. And so he prayed, God, please come and give, it, give us the message again. And so the, the angel comes back again to the both of them, gives them the message about this son that would be born to them and how they should take care of him. And then um, Manoah, verse 17, Manoah asked the angel of the Lord, what is your name? For when all this comes true, we want to honor you. Why do you ask my name, the angel Lord replied. It is too wonderful you to understand. Then Manoah took a, a young goat and grain offering and offered it on the rock as a sacrifice to the Lord. And as Manoah and his wife watched, the Lord did an amazing thing. As the flames from the altar shot up toward the sky, the angel of the Lord ascended in the fire. When Noah and his wife saw this, they fell down with their faces to the ground. The angel did not appear again to Manoah and his wife. And Manoah finally realized it was the angel of the Lord, and he said to his wife, We will certainly die, for we have seen God. And his wife was very practical. Notice what she says in the next verse. If God were going to kill us, he wouldn't have accepted our burnt offering and grain offering. He wouldn't have appeared to us and told us this wonderful thing. 
and done these miracles. So here's several different instances where God comes in this angel of the Lord, reveals himself to people, and they think they're going to die. And he has to tell them, don't be afraid. So let's go to the this Christmas story. Go to Luke chapter 1. And we find a couple more instances there that illustrate this point. Luke chapter 1. And Zechariah is a priest in the temple, and it's his, he's chosen to, to go into the, the temple on this particular, uh, the sanctuary, on this particular day. And so, verse 11, while Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel of the Lord said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. So again, he's afraid. The angel says, don't be afraid. And then, later in that chapter, the angel comes again. Angel Gabriel comes this time to Mary. Verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. And Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favorite woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. And what does the angel say? Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. The shepherds, chapter 2, in our scripture passage, chapter 2, verse 8. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly the angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. I submit to you that God realized that once we had sinned, something would change within us and we would be afraid of him. And so how could he then come and meet with us and convince us of his love for us if we were afraid? All he wants is for us to come to trust him and, and you can't trust someone that you're afraid of. And so he thought, if I come as a baby, nobody is afraid of a baby. I mean, babies are just so cuddly and warm, you want to hold them, you want to... Nobody's afraid of a baby, unless it needs to be changed. Then maybe <laughs> some of us would be afraid of a baby. But for the most part, you can't be afraid of a baby. And so God comes as a baby. And I submit to you... Well, let's, let's continue with, with the story. The shepherds, they come and they see and then it says they, they were so astonished. Um, the people were so astonished when they heard the shepherd's story. And Mary kept these things in her heart. And the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. And then in verse 52 of chapter 2, it says, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. And so Jesus grows up physically, he grows up intellectually, and he grows up relationally. He has a relationship with God, and he has a relationship with people. He becomes a well-rounded person, and people get to know him, and they, they, they like him. He was a likable kind of person. You see, God in Jesus comes as a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, 
And as he grows, Jesus works his way into our hearts, into their hearts. And they really had no idea that this was God. They had no clue until after his resurrection. The disciples followed him, they walked with him, they ate with him, but they saw him as a teacher, as a, as a rabbi, a miracle worker, perhaps even the Messiah. But I don't think they really believed that he was God. Not until the resurrection. So let's look at some of the exchanges that happened after the resurrection. So let's go to Matthew 28. Matthew 28, just at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. And it says, early in the morning, on su early on Sunday morning, starting at verse 1, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord had come down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothes was as white as stone. And then notice, the guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell down into a dead faint. And Jesus is resurrected and comes out of the tomb. The soldiers don't see him because they, they've fallen down because of the brightness of this angel. And then the angel spoke to the women who have now arrived in verse 5. and says, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come, see where his body was lying. And now go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. And so the women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet and worshiped him. And then Jesus told them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. Turn to John, chapter 20. John, chapter 20. And pick up the story as John tells the story, as, as Mary comes back to the disciples, and she says in verse 18, I have seen the Lord, and she gave them his message. And then verse 19 of John 20. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. And notice what Jesus said. He doesn't say, don't be afraid. He says, peace be unto you. Because now they realize if this Jesus that they had seen crucified has come back to life, he must be God. And if there was ever a time that they would be afraid, if they hadn't gotten to know him before, it would be now. But they had gotten to know him. They knew they could trust him. They didn't need to be afraid. And Jesus just wants to reassure them, everything's okay. Even though you abandoned me in the garden and left me alone and I end up being crucified and dying on the cross, it's okay. Peace be unto you. It's all right. And, and remember, Thomas wasn't there in that group. And so eight days later, the same, things hap the same thing happens when Thomas is there. And again, Jesus says in verse 26, suddenly before them, Jesus was standing among them as before, and he says to them, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Notice that Jesus only reveals himself after his resurrection to the believers. Have you ever wondered why? Why not 
reveal himself to Pilate or Herod or the high priest. Kind of set the record straight with them. See, this is what you did to me, but I am really someone that you didn't expect. I am God. But he doesn't do that. Because you see, I believe even those people and even the soldiers that had actually beat him and, and put him on the cross, if they had been confronted with Jesus after and realized who he really was, the mental anguish that they would have, have experienced would have been devastating for them. Kind of like the mental anguish that I believe Judas experienced when he realized that he had betrayed an innocent man to be crucified on the cross. And that mental anguish was so great, was so severe, that he couldn't live with himself. And he went out and took his own life. Jesus isn't in the business of making us feel worse. He's in the business of helping us get to know him so we can genuinely trust him. Amen. And so as a result, he comes as a bee. Because nobody is afraid of a bee. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. <coughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And notice what Paul says. He says, starting at verse 18, And all of this is a gift from God, who brought us back to himself through Christ. So Paul here is saying, God has brought us back to himself through Christ. He, he, through Christ, he is attempting to change our minds about God. He doesn't have to change God's mind about us. Because we're the ones that have wandered away. God was always there. Just as he had come to the garden to, to, to see Adam and Eve in the evening, he, he's still coming to meet with us, but we, we're hiding. And so he, he has brought us back to himself through Christ, and God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. In Jesus, in this, this baby that was born that grew up to become a young man, God was reconciling the world to himself and as a result is no longer holding our sin against us. And so he says, and gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are God's ambassadors, making, God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, when we plead, come back to God. So have you ever had a discussion with your friends to know did my mic just die? Okay. Have you ever had a discussion with your friends, perhaps at work or some other setting, and, 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 and just question what their impression of God is? is? Is God someone that they perhaps fear and have serious question about? Because here Paul is saying, God is wanting us to help them realize who God really is so that they can be reconciled back to God too. There's one last passage that I want you to turn with me to, and that's Romans chapter 5. And then we'll conclude. Romans chapter 5, starting at verse 1. Therefore, since we have been made right with God, sorry, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Now, I want you to, to just entertain a slight change of reading of that text. He says, therefore, since we have been made right with God in God's sight by faith. And we can read that and say, well, but 
I don't have that much faith. Maybe, you know, the, the enemy whispers in our ear, you, you don't have that much faith. But a, a more accurate reading of that verse should be by Christ's faithfulness. It's not on us and how much faith we have. It's that we have been made right in God's sight by Christ's faithfulness. And therefore we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Because of, and I'm going to make that change again, His faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. You see, if we don't make this about His faith and still think it's our faith, we will never have the confidence that we can be assured and joyfully look forward to His coming. Because we never know whether we had the right kind of faith or enough faith. But if we make it about His faithfulness, then we can have that confidence and that joy right now. Because we know that He was faithful. So drop down to verse 8. But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have made, been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us from condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of His Son, while we were still His enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of His Son. So now, we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. Amen. Amen. Amazing. That we who think that when God shows up we need to be afraid, we can actually know that we are His friends. He wants us to be reconciled to Him, to realize that He loves us more than we can understand and comprehend. We are friends of God. Mary, did you know that the, your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Did you know that your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? That sleeping child you're holding is the great I Am. Mary, did you know? Let's sing together our closing hymn. Joy to the world, because we know who this baby boy was, and he came to tell us that we are the friends of God. <laughs>